there's not really many other figures um, that look like me, that were that influential, that fast, that, um, that outstanding. Um, and it just, it was, it, it helped me look up to something. Because trust me, I still have pictures with his signature all over my wall. Because um, my first USA na and my first YMCA Nationals was he was there signing autographs, and I could I was dying to go to that Nationals. The only reason I made that Nationals was because I knew he was going to be there, and having somebody um, that looks like me that is that fast, and having him as a role model, is beyond motivating. It, it just wow. I've always I've always found it easier to look up to somebody, um, and want to beat them and then use that as a goal and a, a stride to get better. All right, nice job. Good set. Let's do some social kick. Welcome right, back guys. to the Social Kick Podcast. I'm Brian Lundquist. We got a full crew, Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and the ridiculously fast high school stud, David <laughs> Curtis. What's up, David? How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Man, you, uh, you've got this whole gaming studio set up behind you. Are you into Fortnite? What's your, uh, what's your routine after practice? <laughs> not a Fortnite star, no. I've actually not really ever played that game. Um, I tend to focus more on a game called Rainbow Six Siege. Oh. I, uh, I help teams out on the side as a, and a statistical analyst and stuff like that, helping um, to help their players improve their performance and stuff like that. And I also stream a little bit on Twitch. Whoa, get out of here. So what uh, What are you planning to study in college? Uh, not that, but... <laughs> um, well, it sounds right pretty analytical, so I'm curious what your uh, you know career interests are or degree interests. You'd be surprised. It's nothing related. Um, okay. I, I'm going into college right now with a major in psychology and a minor in criminology because the, uh, the hope is to make the Bureau of Investigations uh, post-college and post-swimming career. So hopefully... Nice. Fingers crossed, everything, all the stars align in terms of that. Wow. All right. Uh, that's what insiders call it, the Bureau. That's good. That's good. Do you, are, what, do you, what do you look like buttoned up? Uh, you're used to wearing uh, – I was all I think of swimmers that, you know, we're so comfortable wearing almost nothing that it's almost weird to be completely buttoned up. But, uh, you know, you'd be going the other kind of suit in that direction. True. I do like wearing a suit. It's comfortable. It's quite the it's quite the opposite of going up in a tech suit in a swim meet, but it's manageable. It is funny. The only time I would ever wear a suit in college was swim meets. You know, we'd always wear a suit to get on the bus and then sit on a bus for eight hours and then come off in the middle of winter. And I had learned tie swimming taught me to tie a tie. Actually, I mean, are people doing that? Not you know, like in the NBA, the coaches don't have to wear suits on the sidelines. They're just wearing their their, tra their tracks. Uh, I wonder if dress codes change in a, in the COVID college scene era. Yeah, I, um, I'm i not sure, really. Yeah. I, I've seen a lot of NC State gear that's just sweatshirts, hoodies, mm -hmm. uh, pants, even logoed shoes with uh, NC State and Adidas. Yeah. But um, my the only person that I've ever seen that to wear, to wear a suit at a swim meet was my coach, uh, George Ward. I believe he wore it my freshman year to, um, it was either, it was probably, I think it was the senior night uh, where everything was finishing up for the season and we were doing remembered things for the seniors that were going to uh, move on eventually at the end of that year. Man, you are entering the phase of your life where you wear nothing but sweats. That is all college swimming is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think he might he might be different. I don't know. He likes to wear suits. Not too many high schoolers are saying that, I think. I so know, I think we I'll got someone that's cut with a different cloth here. Maybe you know. I'll switch it up once in a while. There you go. Well, there's gotta be something high school, what's going on for high school in New Jersey? Uh, things are on and off. My school is pretty good. The, it's a private school, so they have a little bit more resources. So they're doing a hybrid learning. I'm currently on that two-week uh, two week quarantine because of the pro series that I was just at in Richmond. Mm -hmm. So um, after that week's over, I'll be going back to hybrid learning with Pennington, which is uh, one week on Monday, Tuesday. Thursday and Friday, and then one week off where it's all week um, on the computer. And well, what about the swimming season? Uh, still, still pretty questionable. Um, yeah. New Jersey just um, released and recognized that swimming didn't have any COVID cases, so we were actually allowed to return to normal swimming uh, swimming routine. <clears throat> before that, um, I, before the pro series, I only had about two and a half weeks to train. And the first week and a half week was um, 
It was it was like six people in a pool, no coach on deck. So it was you were coaching yourself. You were with five other of your swimmers, trying to motivate and coach each other, which was difficult. But we managed, and then um, back to normal swimming with that last week before uh, the pro series. But right now everything seems to be um, pretty oh, more open than it was, and getting better increasingly as these vaccines come out. Where do you so George is your high school coach and Sue is your Y coach. Where do you train more? Do you eat, share it up? Ex describe your, your, your routine. Who's your primary coach? Who writes your programs? Where do you go more often? And what's your programs like? Well, previous to COVID and this whole high school thing, uh, I used to do um, like 70%, 60% Sue and uh, that 40%, 30% with Coach Ward, um, because my swimming team, it's their practices aren't necessarily at the level of challenge that I need to be at to improve. Right. So um, uh, I try to meet the requirement for Pennington in order to make their practice requirement to compete, but for, uh, for, my, for me to improve, I need to be at Sue's practices because they're, they're tailored more for swimmers that are club swimmers, not people that come and swim one season a year, and they're, yeah. uh, they're, they're just more tailored to me. And... and um, and stuff like that. But um, Ward's practices themselves, he actually will come up once in a while with the USRPT set that is killer. So um, always going to those practices, being with the team is awesome. But Which one is it? I don't really know how to describe it because he and the other coach just has us do repeated tw 25, 50s, and 75s at random. So they'll yell 25, and the second that you hear 25, you have to go full out sprint. The, the, the break... Um, in between each lap is you don't know how long you're going to get. So maybe he'll say 25 and then half a second after you touch the wall, he's going to yell 75 and you're gone. And then you maybe have 30 minutes, you may have four minutes and then you're, you're going again doing a 50. So it's, it's sporadic, but it's, I love it. It's my favorite set of all time. Nice. Oh, <laughs> you've got to try that. That's so crazy. Hey, what also, why, why are we still in this world of um, high school requirements of like some of the, you're one of the fastest swimmers in the country. Why, <laughs> like, like ever in high school, by the way. So why are, why are we still talking about, you have to meet a minimum requirement to get on your high school team. This is like so ludicrous. I, I believe know. it's the regulation for my school because we don't, yeah. have, we don't have a gym class. We have uh, sports. And uh, you have to compete in two sports for the school to get your um, PE requirement. Mm -hmm. So there's certain requirements for every single sport. And there's a practice requirement mm -hmm. and an attendance requirement that you have to meet in order to get that credit. And you have to graduate with, with eight credits, at least, I believe, seven or eight credits in order to graduate with a successful uh, uh, diploma. Yeah. But I think what I'm getting at is that it's kind of backwards because – you know, the whole the whole point of educating youth on physical fitness is so that you understand how to treat your body. <laughs> Clearly, you do. <laughs> he needs to know how to do relay starts or he might not make the high school relay. Come on. We know that's what these high school workouts are for. <laughs> yeah, still working on that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a like a, a that. OK, so I, I enjoy that kind of pain. Um, but, and so I, I, I could see the appeal of that kind of, that kind of workout. How much of your current, um, training program involves USRPT? Um, not much. Um, I'll do a set here and there. Um, a lot of like the big sets that I do of uh, repetition training is, uh, six fifties on six minutes where I'm just doing full out sprint total, um, total full sprint from the wall to wall, um, as fast as I can go. And I'll do that every once in a while. Try mostly before meet, maybe a week before meet, so I can get my sprint, uh, my sprint muscles going at least, as I try to keep those um, active as much as possible. But surprisingly, I I train more um, like hundreds and one fifties base, because mm -hmm. my coach is very very adamant in making sure I have an athletic base so I can survive throughout a hundred, which. This uh, this pro series, I did not because I did not have the base uh, in order to compete at that level. But um, she she really she's really really uh, good at making sure that all of her swimmers can start out fast at uh, top speed and then hold themselves through through that last and final wall, um, which is where I focused on mainly for my training. 
Yeah, I'd love to learn more about what are some things you're working on for the 50 free right now, either with uh, Coach Sue or the high school coach. And then also, like you said, the Hunter free, obviously, it sounds like training just wasn't behind you due to some of the COVID regulations. But what you see you need to work on for getting to that next level in the 100 like you have in the 50. The biggest thing is the base because I started out pretty good. I was watching the review of the video and I was out um, right off the start with Coleman and Justin who ended up doing very well in that 100 uh, along with uh, Serhoff and it was basically just the back half where I didn't have the strength to surge and stay with them and I uh, I died off pretty hard so it, it's working on the leg strength and leg uh, speed endurance and then the upper body uh, the pull and the endurance that I have there to be able to finish that race as fast as I started it um, for the 50 it's a lot easier to train for that and a lot easier not to be in the pool and still be successful um, because I have that sprint tissue and sprint fi nerves nerve fibers in there like everything just some of that doesn't go away, even with me sitting out for weeks on end. Um, mm -hmm. But I've been doing a ton, a ton, a ton of out-of-the-pool out work with my, uh, my personal trainer, Dave Tease. Uh, I work with him. He's on the national team roster with me uh, as, my, as my trainer. We do a lot of body weight training, a lot of stability training, and a lot of isolation training in terms of isolating individual muscles and strengthening them so that my start can be better, my kick can be better. My underwater can be better. My, my the, the raise on my stroke, the recovery on my stroke can be stronger and waste less energy. Oh, he's very specific, and he looks finds individual parts, does tons of research on them, and then um, he then will isolate that in the next workout. So we work on that part, and it's not it never is a generic workout. It's always individualized to me and what my needs are. I think you may have just pointed out to one of the keys. We were talking earlier about your stroke and you have a very um, distinctive stroke in your fifth day at least. That's the only time I've seen you swim. Um, you know, you got this massive kick. You kick your kick comes out the water sometimes. You almost look like you're swimming downhill. Your stroke rate is, is low and you're going so fast. It just means you're grabbing so much water and you're so strong. You're grabbing it so well. And John, Brian, it must be where you just described a huge part of it, right? Just that whole power and ability to feel the water so well. Yeah, um, the big part of my 50 is power. Um, yeah. That's what I work on a lot with my training with my training partners and Dave. It's just all about um, the maximum amount of power that I have in my pulls. Like I, I, I try not to spin because I feel extremely ineffective and I don't go as fast if I'm spinning. Yes, my arms are moving faster. I've tried it before in a race and it did not work. It's just focusing on the recovery, the fast recovery on top of the water and how much water I'm grabbing with my arms um, and how I'm utilizing that and pushing it behind me because I'd rather be pulling a lot more water and going faster and have a slower stroke rate than having a higher stroke rate, taking less water and then wasting more energy that I could be using in that back half, that last five meters, that last sprint push. What yeah. happened to hundred? Go ahead, Brian. Well, I was going to say, if you're, you mentioned your training is, yeah, I think probably the same direction Luke is going to go. The, the 100 and 150 and doing some of the longer distance stuff and then coming down to race. How do you, how do you apply that sort of application on the water, maximizing force, maximizing power, when a lot of the rest of the training is based around, you know, this is notorious for swimming. It sounds like you're probably somewhere hybrid in the middle where, you know, we're swimming these longer distances and then coming down to sprint for just 21 seconds. So, like, how are you, how are you thinking about applying power to the water when you're doing training and some of the kind of, like, training for the 100 so that you have that speed endurance? So what I tend to do for the 100 freestyle, if I'm perfectly in season and working hard, is I try to pull more. That pull strength with the, uh, the paddles helps me strengthen my shoulders and my core so I can have that strong pull. And focusing on the power when I don't have equipment on, it's just all about bringing my, I, I, don't, I don't really know how to explain it. It's just, it's, it's becoming more automatic for me that I have to actually think about this now. Um, it's just, all about the utilization of how I pull my arm underneath the water, the angle of what I pull it at, how much water I'm catching from, say, my shoulder to right about here on my wrist, which is where I focus on. I focus on all the water pull from here all the way down to my shoulder. It's all about that pull. And I worry less about, um, I actually know, I worry more about stroke count and I try to keep it as low as possible mm -hmm. on every single lap, no matter the distance. 
So uh, I believe I was looking at some of the st statistics from my 50 freestyles recently from Worlds and the Pro Series and Nationals, and I have around 17 cycles in 15-meter uh, uh, freestyle <laughs> compared to some of my teammates that have around 26-ish. How tall are you? And yeah. I am just about, just about six foot tall. Six foot only? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. My, my wingspan is a lot larger than my height, though. Um, yeah, I think I was... I think so. I'm six four, and I think I took thirty six strokes. Um, so yeah, just you're you're taking fewer cycles than I am, which is which is huge. Are you a good puller? I mean, do you pull a lot then? Surprisingly, not as much as you would think I would. Um, okay. I pull. It's a part of my warm up routine. My coach has uh, the same standard warm up routine that we I've had since I've ever started with her. It tends to be more of a a longer distance swim, maybe a 400, sometimes with fins, so we can take the pressure off our arms if we had hard practice the previous night. We go into a little bit of a drill kick hybrid, and then we go into a pull. We tend to do either six, 600 to 1,000 yards of um, either straight pull or um, hundreds of pull on uh, five seconds above base interval, which for me is uh, 110. Um, so we just, she, I don't, it's, it's kind of built in as well. Um, outside of that uh, 600 to 1,000 yards of pull itself dedicated with the equipment. Um, she'll, she'll come in and say uh, one breath, low stroke count so that we're focusing on the pull and we're lengthening our stroke and using the entire length of our arms and utilizing that uh, correctly so that we don't find ourselves uh, chopping in or not using our arms to what the capability uh, of it should be. Yeah. Huh. What... <clears throat> Let's go back. What what was your introduction to swimming? Yeah. Because you like the way that you're talking about uh, the stroke mechanics and the way that you talk about training, it, it feels very different to the status quo of age group swimming within you know the U.S. At least as far as I'm concerned. So I'm I'm really curious to know about more about your foundation. Uh, around eight years old. I, um, I started swimming at the YMCA as a part of a water safety because uh, my parents didn't want me to drown in the case that I were put in the water and I didn't really know what to do. Um, I am adopted, so I was in a place that was not the best previous to that adoption. Um, so I was very, I had a lot of issues with sensory um, adaptation and the people that worked with me in physical therapy said uh, that water is the best place to um, balance yourself and center yourself and figure out where your body is. And at the time, that was the best thing for mentally for me and then also physically so that I would understand what to do in a situation if I were put into water. And it kind of hit off almost instantly because not only was I comfortable in the water, I uh, kind of took to it rather fast and accelerated in the courses faster than the, uh, it, um, like the curriculum had for me. Yeah. And then uh, the, just the lifeguard that was working with me and the, the swim instructor was like, you got to get him on the swim team. And then it all started from there. Wow. Was this at Hamilton Y, where you're at now? Or? No, actually. Okay. I've been on two previous teams before. It started, okay. up Pen, it started up Pensbury Aquatics, okay, which is a club team off of a high school team, which is not too far from me. And then I went to Trihampton YMCA, which was my introduction to the YMCA. I was there for quite a long time. But the coaching staff situation there wasn't stable. They lost head coaches every single year I was there. So there was a new head coach every single year, which for me wasn't ideal because I got to know the coach. I got to understand him or her in one case. And then they would, um, they'd find somewhere else and then end up leaving. So I went to um, Hamilton Aquatics, maybe, I don't even remember how long ago. It feels like ages, maybe about three years ago. Um, after an introduction that I had with Sue Welsh at YMCA mm -hmm. Nationals because I was alone at that Nationals because no, nobody else on my team had the time to qualify. So I, uh, they picked me up and uh, I stayed with their team so I could have more um, interactions with people from Jersey. Definitely. And obviously, Sue's been at Hamilton for a while, so you don't have to worry about coaching turnover. Nope. But what type of swimmer were you when you went to Hamilton and what changes have you made and seen since then? Coming from Trihampton YMCA, I was a mess. Um, I, I, number one, didn't have the uh, work ethic that I do today. I just didn't really care. Like I was kind of, at that point, naturally fast. I don't want to say I don't want to say that in a cocky way, but um, like you're I going twenty one eight, you're naturally <laughs> some. Let's be honest here. Come hey, on, listen, now. If you got it, you got it. You know. It's cool. 
I didn't work for my tons uh, previous to Sue. Like I, I would sit out a lot. I just didn't have the I didn't have the motivation or the work ethic that I uh, that Sue brought to me. But um, the coaching staff at Trihampton didn't really challenge me in terms of that work ethic, so I kind of got away with it for way too long. And once I joined Trihampton, excuse me, once I joined Hamilton, uh, she did start challenging me, um, keeping me in the water. And she did start giving me practices that I've never seen before and practices that made me hurt and stuff I could not physically do at that point. So that it made me want to do those practices to complete them, to make sure that, uh, that I would improve. And so like, she gave me goals um, that most definitely helped me improve uh, my work ethic, my mental game, and then also um, just my overall swimming ability. I wanted to get into, um, you know, you being a black swimmer at an elite level and you starting swimming at age eight. And um, the whole reason you got in is the, is, the, is the parents, you know, the fear of drowning and learning to swim. And you going to NC State next year. Um, Brian's um, teammate at one point, Cullen Jones, that's where he swam at one point. Cullen was one of the top swimmers in the world when you started swimming. Colin right now is working USA Swimming to do exactly that, to stop the stigma that, that black kids can't swim and to stop people from drowning. Just talk about those role models and, and the influences. And because and, you are becoming your own role model right now. It's, 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 and you are similar to what Colin has been doing. Um, so from what I could comprehend the international swimming world, Colin Jones was always on my mind because um, there's not really many other figures um, that look like me, that were that influential, that fast, that um, that outstanding, um, and it just it was it, it helped me look up to something, because trust me, I still have pictures with his signature all over my wall, because um, my first USA and my first YMCA nationals was he was there signing autographs, and I could I was dying to go to that nationals. The only reason I made that nationals was because I knew he was going to be there. And having somebody um, that looks like me that is that fast and having him as a role model is beyond motivating. It, it just, wow. I've, always, I've always found it easier to look up to somebody um, and want to beat them and then use that as a goal and a, a stride to get better. Um, somebody asked me before, um, what's my goal to getting better? And I, I told them, uh, find somebody that's faster than you and work every day to beat them. And that, I mean, that's, that's the motto I've lived with um, from day one to now. I'm looking up to Colin Jones and seeing that, that it's possible for somebody like me to achieve such high honors and such high, high, um, high goals and stuff like that. Um, I was going to, that, that's moving, man. I mean, uh, Brian, you know Colin, and you know what he's like and where he came from, and I'm sure he'd be so touched even though he influenced one person far less to a particular level. Um, what made you decide to do the, the NC State route? Was it because of the similar path he went? Did, did you feel that support from Brandon? What, what was the deciding factor to have this path to go for, to continue your journey? Because you have obviously have set your high levels of where you want to be in your career, in your swimming. What made you decide this? You've had a good foundation so far. So I, I was looking to a lot of schools. I started narrowing down um, onto the East Coast because I did not want to be within, um, I wanted to be within driving distance of my parents just in case anything were to happen. So I'd be uh, close to home. It's just a personal thing for me. But um, there was a lot of factors that went into uh, NC State as my choice. Um, number one, the big, the big thing is um, that um, I'm a big family person. I love people um, that I like that I know and care for. Um, I like to just be around my family and um, do things with them because it just makes me feel happy and at home. And I felt like I was going from Hamilton Y family, from my own home family, and I was I was welcomed into a, a family's arms the second I was there on my recruiting trip. Like it, I didn't feel like a recruit. I did not feel like a recruit. I could not tell who was an NCAA champion and who was um, a walk-on, or who was a diver and who was a swimmer. Everyone was family. Everyone understood each other. There was just a mutual respect and a mutual love for everyone on that team that uh, I, I could not pass up. Why is that important? You and I chatted briefly on message, and you said that you know, a huge part of your success is your coaching and your family, your support. 
and you know you you you've had a, a, a tough time at it um you are a minority in the sports you've you've gone for why and you're going to a place where you have a solid family again why is that so hard so so important for you to get through i mean because this is a tough sport isn't it in many ways not just training talk about that the importance um the importance of family to me um is i i love this sport but then again it's just not it's not the easiest thing to do uh you're you're just swimming individually a lot of the time relays yes they happen they're awesome that's what i live for by the way love relays um it's it's hard not to have something like that to be have somebody backing you up and have somebody holding you hold, like near you holding it with you and like working with you and i just i couldn't really give up um the family that i have here and that feeling i really wanted to be able to have that um that idea that i have somebody supporting me and that i have teammates that are working for goals that are similar to mine and that are at the higher caliber that m basically all the nc state swimmers are at um but yeah it's just the the whole the whole idea of family is an absolutely necessary factor in order for me to swim otherwise i would not I, if relays didn't exist i would not be swimming wow that says a lot about you i'm curious to see how you how 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 you perform on nc state relays college relays you're certainly on the path to be on you know some some big time team usa relays um you know and with that in mind what i what i'm curious about is we talk about you know cullen and the influence that he had on you and how and 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 how that can really form you know the the mindset of you know somebody who can't necessarily see themselves on the olympic team but they can identify with uh someone you know who's successful and 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 looks like them and maybe came from somewhat of a similar background as, as they did um and and follow that path what what i'm curious about is like have have you started to think about the potential for you to be that influencer on other people? Um, you know, what has, has that entered your frame of mind yet? Um, it, I'm going to, I'm going to say not really. Uh, I try not, I don't really, I try not to focus on myself as much. I try to focus on the um, analytical side of things. So like, I don't focus on maybe what I'm, doing to other what I'm motivating other people um I try to make sure that I'm doing things right and I'm talking to people correctly and address it like I I, I don't know how to explain it uh, I, I don't really the only self analyzation I tend to do is um regarding something that I need to fix like uh swimming abilities or um any type of manners or something like that but um I have been noticing recently uh, I've gotten a lot of DMs and stuff like that to keep 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 going with with what I'm doing. That I've been um, inspiring people, which is beyond like it's a feeling that I cannot describe to you, because um, along with me performing well and helping other people, to have them let me know that I'm inspiring them, it, that's just another reason for me to continue swimming. No, it's great stuff, and I. I know you're inspiring people. You're inspiring us. We're a bunch of old guys here. I know Luke's been DMing you constantly. I'll try to get him to not send you a thousand a day. But one thing I wanted to talk about, because with the high performers I work with, you know, some are very analytical, like it sounds like you are. I'd like to learn about how you balance swimming analytics and just being able to perform. Because obviously you can't go to the block in robot mode thinking about just analytics especially for the 50 i'm sure brian could attest to this you got to just get up there and rock it so how do you balance those two sides and how do you use analytics with sue and the rest of the coaching staff um i tend i'm i'm very lucky to be on team usa for one uh and they have an extremely good high performance staff that takes mm -hmm. videos of my races and does uh statistics on the races themselves whether it be the 15 meter mark the underwater and the stroke cycles so I, I tend to look at those a lot when I'm practicing so that um, when I'm looking at those stats, like, for example, the first 15 meters at Worlds was the slowest um, part of my race. And I tended to build on my 50 freestyle, which in essence is not what you're supposed to do in a 50 freestyle. You're supposed to be, uh, you're supposed to be guns up, going right from it from the start. 
Um, so I took that, I took those analytics from that beat and put them, applied them into practice. So I was working on those breakouts. I was working on the underwaters. Um, I was working on the kicking and the kick strength and the kick rate that it was to make it as high as possible. And then I also take that, those analytics and take them out of the pool and go to Dave T's and I'm doing lifts that improve my start. Uh, reaction time, working on raw reaction timing, uh, stability, so that I have a stronger block presence, and uh, core, so that I have better underwaters. And um, I try to make sure that doesn't go into the pool when I'm at a swim meet. Like I will. The the only thought I really have in my mind is, look, I've looked at this before. I've thought about this. I've trained, thinking about these analytics and thinking about how I'm going to fix these certain parts of my race that aren't as fast as they can be. And then I'm just going to rely on my training and just go with what I have and hope for the best. David, what is block presence? Um, I, I am kind of very, very, um, I'm, I, I, I do not have good balance. So I, I cannot balance very well. Like you'll see me wobble on the block occasionally. And that's just because my balance is atrocious. But um, that's one part of what I mean with block presence. That's what me and Dave call it. Um, just the strength of my arms on the block, the strength of my kickback on the uh, the fin, uh, how strong I am when I go down and tense up, and then obviously the stability. It's just all the different aspects of the uh, the start itself, from going down and then jumping off. Mm -hmm. When are you? Um, <clears throat> what changes are you making, and when are you breaking Caleb's record, his high school record? What day? We can uh, tell you if we want. We can let you know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to break it, but that's definitely a, that's definitely a goal for me um, in my last high school season coming up. Uh, I, it's it's unclear when I'm going to have high school meets because of COVID. Um, hopefully, Easterns happens because yeah. if it does, if Easterns does happen, I'm going to full taper for that and shave so that I um, I can I can attempt to get that record in the hundred as well. Because what do you need to do? 100. What do you need to do to break that record besides just Sprint your mind out. Have you noticed something in that 19.4 that, oh, that was easy fix and I fixed it already in that 21.8 I just did? Yes. Uh, there's been a lot of fixes since that 19.4, um, hence why uh, untapered and unrested I went a 21.8, which is, for me, mind-blowing. I was, I was, my goal was a 22.5 for that meet, and <laughs> I went 21.8 in prelims, and that was... I, I, yeah, I believe somebody caught it on camera. My face was just so confused. <laughs> but um, yeah, I've definitely improved the first 15 meters of my race in terms of the underwater. I've been working with uh, Russell Mark, who is yep. the head, um, I'm going to say, technique analyst. I'm not really sure what his position title is. But he's done. he's helped me so much on my start and uh, helped me look at other people's starts like Caleb Dressel and fine-tune it so that it's as effective as possible because what happened on my start in Budapest is my legs dropped and my mm -hmm. feet hit the water as my body entered. So I created drag, which added a ton of time. And eliminating that by um, fixing up the start and fine tuning it so that it works for me uh, with Russell, I was able to make things a lot faster. And that was, that was only just fixed um, post, actually by the beginning of COVID, um, before or after the Easterns and before the Pro Series. How you approach the wall in your 19.4? Have you noticed that? You approach, could you think you could imp improve the approach in the wall in 19.4 better? I mean, I know that comes with racing and timing and just being up there, or is that just a one-off thing? Yes, I can. Um, definitely with the start fixed the fixed 15 meters that yeah. I have, yeah. it's definitely going to contribute positively to yeah. that time. But um, going into the wall and coming off the wall is definitely something I need to work on. My flip turn, uh, I, I do... I my leg base is bigger than my torso so it takes me a little bit longer to get my legs over in a turn mm -hmm. so it can come off as slow mm -hmm. so improving that as long uh, along with my underwater off that wall which has actually been better off the wall than it has been off the start which i need to fix but all those different micro fixes in that 50 freestyle whether it be that turn or that start or even just where i breathe and how i breathe um believe nathan adrian shouted me out in that intro uh, the way he quick breathes is something I've been looking at in terms about how uh, how he, uh, the breath that he takes is so fast that it doesn't throw his body out of line. Just those, just those individual things, I think, 
by working on them in the pool and then working on the strength aspect out is going to bring that down to hopefully what I want is an 18.9. <laughs> There you go. That'd be huge. We're all excited for that. But obviously, Olympic trials, Olympics, long course swimming is also on all of our forethoughts and, and what we want to see. So you said the start. I agree. The start something that when we were watching your video, we're like, yeah, there's some room to improve there, especially when you're looking at Caleb and some of those other guys. Right. Um, you mentioned kind of building that 50 at Budapest, I believe, is where that race was. What are some other long course changes you're looking to make in that 50? And what are you hoping to go? Well, I've been thinking about this a lot. <laughs> and one of the issues I have with my 50 is the where I breathe and where I utilize that breath. Mm. Um, I failed to do it correctly <laughs> at the Pro Series in the final, hence why I went to 21.9, uh, because I breathe twice. Uh, I breathed way too soon, and that resulted in me almost blacking out, so I had to take the breath, and I couldn't finish the race if I didn't, which would have been ah, would have been so much faster if I had, because I had, I had so much energy in that one. But um, So definitely thinking about the utilization of that breath and working on the breath control, uh, and that's only going to come in practice, um, working on that breath control with pulling, by the way. I tend to do breath control more with pulling. So expanding my lungs and making sure that I can withhold as much uh, as much of that breath as I can, so I can uh, use less energy and use more energy and just surging to that wall. Where um, do you where do you want to take a breath? What I what I plan on I usually plan on doing it around the thirty five or the forty, so that I only have about fifteen uh, fifteen meters to go or ten meters to go until that finish, which for me is plenty of plenty enough to do that final surge into the finish with the with a nose breath, um, no breath surge into the wall. But um, I believe I was a little bit past the 30, a little bit before the 35 and way before the 35 in the prelim and final in the series, which is why it didn't, didn't necessarily go as blind. I mean, a lot of the top guys won't take a breath at all in the 50 long course. Is this something that you've thought about or why do you think one breath is the best strategy for you? Or is that just the best strategy at this moment? Um, I suffer from pretty bad asthma, so mm. my lungs don't really expand to what uh, the normal uh, mm. the normal humans uh, lungs should expand to. So the length of like the length of time that I have to breathe is significantly shortened. So I, sure. taking one breath isn't absolutely necessary for me. I cannot do a full fifty long course without breathing nor short course. Um, just for my physical safety, I'm not. I don't want to push it because things go south pretty quickly. Gotcha. Um, for me, so I tend to think about where I'm going to place that breath because not only does that breath um, save me from dying, it helps me. Um, rejuvenate my muscles with that extra oxygen um, so that I can finish stronger and have, uh, I think, in my opinion, more energy because of that oxygen. Is that something you've talked to the NC State coaching staff about? Because breath holding is obviously a big component to, um, you know, even for the short axis strokes to, uh, well, for all strokes, really, in the short course format, um, which college season is focused on, even though we're all focused on the Olympic Games, you know, it's, it's a big component. So I'm curious kind of how, you know, there's there's a, a road to navigate with someone in your situation. I'm curious if that topic's come up. It actually hasn't really. Um, I'm sure they notice um, they do a lot of scouting because they are very, very good at looking at those individual things and looking at um, things to improve and how to individualize training for each athlete. But that's one thing that they stress a lot is it's not basic training. Not everyone does the same thing. You do what's best for you. Right. Um, but at, at this moment, um, we have I haven't had a chat about uh, my breathing situation because um, I haven't really thought uh, too much of an issue to discuss. But um, definitely I should. I definitely should look into that so I can make them aware that um, breathing is a necessity for me in order to uh, survive. In the well, we'll just cut that section and we'll send them a clip. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I can send it to Brayden. No, he'll, he'll appreciate it. <laughs> I got a question for for you about you mentioned this a couple of times and um, earlier when you said you know about sprinting. I can just get ready to sprint. It's it's you know my fastest fibers. I can get up and go. I know what it is. Um, the four of us here. Are sprinters. Um, two of us have gone 21 long course. Not me. 
you guys guess that. 50% of us here have. <laughs> yeah, I've gone 21 long course. What, the, what is a world-class sprinter to you? We're doing, we're doing a show on sprinting next week. Um, and, and at speed, what, what is that? What does that mean? Like, you know, as a 50, what switches in your head? What is that feeling you have in your soul? What is, what is raw speed that has you going to that once in a generational kind of speed? What is that? Um, well, when I, when I think about speed, I think about thoughtless um, controlled technique. That's what I want. That's what I'm going to call it for now. I'm thinking about um, everything that I've worked on in practice in terms of perfecting that technique and not thinking about a thing. Because if I think about anything before my 50 freestyle, but a blank, uh, like my, my mind is completely blank when I swim the 50 freestyle, because all I need to think about is that I'm going to be going fast for uh, the short amount of time that I have and just to rely on what I've trained for. But uh, the raw speed, the, I cannot describe the feeling before 50 freestyle to big meet. The, the heart's pounding. I, I sometimes I'm sweating because I'm so anxious to get in the pool. It's just it's just um, it's so much different than swimming any other event. Even from the hundred freestyle, it's just it's such a short race. It's just such a micro um, technique race where if you mess up one thing or if you get everything right, you're set or you're, or it's over. It's just it's just I, I honestly do not have do not know how to explain it uh, because of um, the mentality that I have for the 50 freestyle where it's um, just you're gonna go for, yeah I just I just think you just go for it um, and that's all that's all I really think about during uh, during the meet time. So what do you Mile guys? They all wish that they could be 50 guys. <laughs> so what do you what do you do, David, to prepare? Uh, what's your pre race routine like? And what, how is it different for the 50 versus the other events? Um, are you ter- talking in terms of warm-up? Uh, warm-up, mental preparation, uh, things that are going through. Yeah, it could be, could be either what you eat, how you sleep. In terms of all racing, um, music is extremely important to me. Um, back to what I was saying, I had issues with sensory when I was really, really young. And one thing that also helped me center myself was music and um just having a big headset on and tuning out to the music that's i still do that today where if things are just quiet i'm going to pop in a headset and just relax there with music and just think about what i what i have to do and what uh what i've done and what are you listening to everything except country (laughs) (laughs) and when i say everything i mean orchestral music i mean dubstep rap i i listen to basically every type of genre because i cannot get my hands on enough music but country <laughs> but country. let's make that clear right <laughs> nc right, state man. roommate whoever you are get that <laughs> through your head yeah okay and so and, and tell me more about warm-up how do you warm up differently um i actually started a new warm-up routine recently that seems to have been working uh, a lot um one thing that i do differently is a routine part of my racing is I warm up in my tech suit. Hmm. Uh, I know a lot of people that don't do that, and I've been scolded by a lot of swimmers that I do do that. Um, scolded? The reason for that is um, I just like to feel – I just want the tech suit to become a part of me, and sometimes if I don't swim with the tech suit on a warm-up, I feel like it's it's a tech suit. Like I don't – it doesn't feel as fluid and natural as if I were uh, wearing it in the pool previous and getting used to the feel of that. Huh. Um, but I tend to focus on in the warm up uh, a lot of swimming. I only swim warm up in 25s. I do not swim uh, anything over 25 in terms of uh, um, like distance. So like I'll be doing 50 to 125s before I start doing my underwater set, which is uh, something I've seen. I I, I kind of fine tuned it to myself. Um, and then I'll go into a, uh, a breakout and then some sprints and then I'll be done. Is that true for just the 50 or do you warm up in only 25s for all races? All races. Where did you pick that up? I've never heard that before. Um, I didn't, I don't know. I just kind of started doing it. Um, I liked like starting, pushing off the wall hard, nice underwater, stopping, resetting, and then starting again. It was just something that I, uh, I'm not a big fan of distance, as you can tell. Um, 25s <laughs> is the most ideal situation for me. 
So um, warming up with something that I'm comfortable with and something that I can feel each individual part of my push from the push to the finish. Um, definitely helps me figure out what's wrong, what else I need to warm up. Say it's my legs are a little bit, a little bit sore, something like that. I need to do more under water, so I can figure that out more by looking at each individual 25 and finding out consistently uh, what's wrong, and then continually warming it up. It, yeah, man, it makes sense. I mean, we talk a lot about n neural connectivity and being in tune with your body, being aware of every stroke, being cognizant of every stroke, and how we're making that shift a little bit in swimming compared to when Luke swam when he did 10,000 a practice and he was a 50 yard freestyler, 50 meter freestyler. Mm, so it's never. nice to hear some of these things starting to happen within the sport with some of the younger generation, because we all know for sprinters doing longer distances, yeah, there's some aerobic benefits, but if you're not connected with it, if you're not fine tuning your strokes or finding some benefit from it, it's likely going to be wasted and actually impairing the neural system for some of the sprint capacity or capability. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Did you watch the ISL? I oh, know you're a fan. What do you think? Briefly, yes. Um, not as much as my friends did, but I did keep an eye on the time and the swimmers that were in that. Yeah. Why briefly was that you were busy or you just weren't interested? It was too much of it. it didn't, like, it wasn't an exciting. Why briefly? Interesting. Actually, um, I actually want to be a part of it. Like, I, I really want to. I really want to survive. So the post college, I can yeah uh, indulge my time in that and elongate my swimming career because um, that's family there. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the teams yeah, really. there look they look like their family, and that's what I want. Um, I think it was just because I was busy. The time that the ISL was out, really, I was um, I was focusing on getting the grades up, finishing my application for school. So I was I was pretty preoccupied mentally during that time, and I didn't really have time. I don't really watch TV other than gaming or um, YouTube, but uh, it just wasn't something that I uh, pursued at that time. Who's your favorite swimmer? Your favorite current swimmer to watch swim? Florida Madden. in the world. Who? Florida Madden. Florida. Florida yep. And who is your favorite swimmer of all time? Colin Jones. Three. Well, back to Colin. You were saying how, you know, you have your idols so you can beat your idols. So what is his best 50 free time? 21.59, I think, is what I'm seeing. Lower. Yes. 50 long course? Am I wrong? Man, Google's yeah. looking wrong. What does he go? Yeah. What do you have? Well, I know he's been 21.4 because he had that American record. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say 21.47. 21.40, American record. Yep. 2009. Okay. All right, so 21.40. Are we going to be seeing it at trials in 2021 out of you? It depends. Okay. Um, depends on my training situation and uh, how things are going with that training and how COVID flattens out. But if ideally, if I were, I'm going to be in the pool from now until the end of, uh, end of, the, end of this season, going into the June – June season and the Olympics, then why not? John and I were talking about what, you know, what trials look like in 53. And I was, I threw a number out there and I started counting and I can see 16 guys going under 22 in America trials. I, 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 I counted 10. Brian. What? I'm asking Brian, does he think 16 guys under 22? The, in the US? No. I counted 10 That's off the top of my head. I counted 10. <laughs> No, no problem. But I was, but then we're talking about what is it going to take to make top two? You know, like like most of those 16 guys are like 21 nines, 21 eights. But what's it going to make to make top two? And we had a hard time thinking who can go 21 four and under. That's more than one or two folks. I'm, I'm thinking the time to make my goal time is 21.26. Um, the two six, unsure why. It was just something I came up with. But I, that's just my ballpark in the range that I want to see myself in, whether it's now or in four years, mm. to make the Olympics, because I think that's going to be the gold standard. That's going to be the second place spot. No, I'm not going to be Caleb. I don't think anybody is. So it's fight for second in that race. And mm. I think that's between the 20, from 22 to and under, I think is going to be the, the ideal um, area of where um, that second place spot is going to be. One thing that Cullen Jones, Brian, talk about this. Cullen always had on the day when it mattered, he always got his hand on the wall first. Always did, and that's what he did. This, I mean, Brian, you have tons of those stories. 
And David, what kind of swimmer are you? Are you that kind of swimmer as well? But Brian, talk about Colin and what you were so impressed when you trained with him and then when he, sh when he showed up the race. Well, there's nobody that I've ever been around. Actually, well, I've been around a few, right? So, like, I, I was training partners with Fred Biscay and Cesar Cielo, right? And so those guys were, you know, two of the first to get under 21 long course, suited whatever. They're still the best runners in the world, um, you know, barrier breakers and... Um, I say Caesar was knew how to knew how to win in the moment. You know, he just like he was one of those guys who just locked in, and um, and you knew kind of on the way to the pool that that he was going to win it. Um, and I knew before 2008 Olympics that Caesar was going to win gold. Uh, you know, and and if you talk to to Brett or anybody else like around who was close around him, you know, there he already knew he was going to win it before that that race happened. And I think Colin was one of those few people who. Uh, had that had that rare ability to turn it on when it was needed when the lights were on Colin was on and you know that that's a that's a that's a rare breed where you know you just smell blood in the water and you know how to get your hand on the wall and when the lights shine brightest you're at your fastest and I'll, I'll have to be honest like there were a lot of times that, um, you know, as I, I, I trained with Colin for six months at swim Mac, um, that was my closest to him as a teammate, but, um, you know, like, was he the fastest in training? No. Uh, was he the most consistent in training? No. Um, but, but what I realized was that like when Colin was on, like he, he knew when to turn it on and he knew how to do it. And that's not something that everybody knows how to do. Um, you know, so, so, so that's that's my understanding, Luke. To answer your question, but to David, to you, like, yeah, what? Who are you? I am not the most consistent trainer. I am not the best in the pool. Um, there's a lot of people that actually have a better base than I do. Um, I just training training has never been in the water, at least something that I've been the best at. Now, out of the water weight training, I tend to excel more. I tend to see better and higher improvement rate there simply because that's something I find I I find myself that I'm better at um but uh when I when I do get when I do get to uh to a pool um people think I hate them because I'm so focused and I'm so um like I'm just I'm getting ready and barreling down inside mentally uh to the point where pre-race um have you guys ever had noise canceling earbuds in sure Yep. Imagine that, but without the earbuds in. That's that's where my head is at, and my ears mm -hmm. actually. I tend not to hear anything but the the start, and I believe that's partially because of my ADHD. But um, it's just for me, um, whether it's having fun at practice or maybe not even performing at the best, it's when you get to the pool, it's it's go time, and it's fo it's it's time to focus up, and. Uh, not waste time because I don't like wasting time. I want to turn it to COVID a little bit and because you just talked about your mindset. Um, man, you might not be able to go to your high school prom. You might not be able to, you know, you, you don't know if you're going to get a chance to break Caleb's record because you don't know. We just don't know what's going on. It's been going on a year now. You've been struggling with COVID. Yet you kept your confidence. You're a very confident young man. How are you doing that? And what advice do you have to those, um, you know, working in similar environments to, like you? Well, I always imagine a very, very, I mean, this is probably the longest tunnel I've ever been in. And uh, I know that no matter what happens, whether things are canceled, whether I can't do certain things or whether I don't perform at the level that I really want to, um, there's going to be a light at that end of the tunnel. And you might as well not waste time pouting about it, that it sucks. And you might as well just try to work and try to get there as fast as you can because... As I said before, I'm not a big person about wasting time, and pouting is a waste of time. And 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 have you have you encouraged younger kids who you know who probably their dream is to make Y nationals? That's the epic, or oh, and, and they're struggling, and they're getting things hit besides COVID. They have a really rough home life. Uh, they have a really really they, they, they're black swimmers, and they're having prejudice prejudice on deck. They don't they can't afford to swim at a swim club. How do you, what advice are you giving them to get through these tough times despite all these things being in front of them? There's a lot of odds that are going to be, sh that are going to be thrown at you, whether it's like you said, financial issues or environmental issues or mental issues or physical issues. 
And um, there's there's two types of people. There's there's one that quits, and then there's one that perseveres. And if you want to be that person that's excited and happy in your own success, you want to be that perseverance person. You want to make sure you need to work to be that perseverance person. And the only advice I have to you is you can be that perseverance person if you want, and you have to work for that. Now, that person that, that quits, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty damn easy. You can just sit down and you can call, you can call quits. It's, it's easier than trying to go to be that perseverance person. And um, everybody should strive to be that perseverance person. It's, it's just you need to choose. How old are you? <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, this is heavy, man. This is great. I agree fully. That's that's so mature, and you, it just shows how well thought and empathetic you are. And like, kudos, you. man. Kudos, David. What's the hardest race in swimming? The hundred freestyle. Would you rather have an Olympic gold medal or set a world record? Olympic gold medal. Who's the greatest sprinter of all time? Caleb Dressel. Why aren't there 25s in competition? Uh, I don't know, and I still question that to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Which ISL team would you want to be on? DC Trident. Why? Because I like Washington, DC, and I like their colors. Well, well it's right on the Eastern Seaboard. They're your local team. Speaking of, speaking of them, are you... Did, so you pick the team straight away, and you, and you answer that question quickly. I wonder, do your teammates, do other people that follow ISL more? You mentioned your teammates and your friends would follow ISL more. Do they identify with a team? Are they fans? Do they have sweatshirts? Do they have merchandise? Are they into it? Like, they but, but for a particular team, are they fans of certain swimmers? <laughs> I know most of my friends are DC Trident fans. Um, and I know one New York Breakers fan. Um, they they do all have sweatshirts. I do not yet, but um, just yeah, they they have actually they actually have a lot of stuff. I should probably ask her some. But we're gonna hook you up. We know we know the GM and the staff, huh? And we're speaking to the captain soon. Yeah, we're gonna hook you up. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> No, that's accepting some sort of. You know, be careful about your eligibility if you do that. Yeah, I oh. don't know if I can accept that yet, but maybe in the future. <laughs> oh man, well, hey, um, I just have one final question for you, which is the difference between short course sprinting and long course sprinting, because the way that you talked about it, it sounded like, um, you know, for you, it's no matter what happens, it's go, okay, mm -hmm. um, and. You know, I was listening to some conversation recently with Anthony Irvin, two-time Olympic gold medalist, 16 years apart, who says that for the long course 50, you build a 50 freestyle. And that sounds counter to what you were saying. But also, toward the end of the race, you're sucking for air. Asthma or not, you know, you're, you're, you're like thinking about breath control and how do I surge to the wall where he's thinking about building. Um, you know, do you, where, do, where does that come from? Um, you know, have, have you played around with different and for, for you, you know that you've got to lock into go fast, go versus, you know, the other school of thought. Um, I used to be able, I used to not have the physical ability to just go right off the bat. So I would physically build. And then I started testing with that go theory and started going sprinting right off the bat. And um, whether it was in the 200 free, which actually I experimented in a, in a, um, in an inter squad meet in December, no, not December. It was it was like a while ago, and I dropped five seconds because I took it out faster. I started experimenting with that go theory, and um, by taking it out faster, yes, I die sooner. But if I work harder in training, and I won't, I'll die later. It's it's inevitable. It's gonna happen. But um, taking it out faster, in my opinion, gets in, it. It's just a a confidence boost seeing your head. Um, whether if I am ahead or not, but um, it's just for me build, building. I tend to not have. I tend to have energy left. Where if I get if I take it out as fast as I can, um, I don't have any energy left, and I hope for the best that I don't die too soon. David, you're a cerebral guy. 
you you clearly uh, think about all of the things related to the sport, and you know, it, 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 you strike me as someone who has um, the part of the contributing factors to why you're successful is that you you have the the mental fortitude as well as the physical acumen to pair those things together. Not to mention the toughness to do twenty fives, fifties, seventy fives, all out. On command, random. which makes me scared to death. <laughs> but anyway, it's Luke fun. John, trust we, me. Should, we should totally do that set. We're gonna make Luke puke in the in the pool. It's gonna be great. We're gonna love it. I can't wait. It's gonna be awesome. Um, David, thanks so much for hanging out with us. We'll call it there. Um, well, yeah, really looking forward to seeing what you do. You know, in the upcoming uh, season for sure. Um, Look forward to seeing that twenty one two six and uh, your career at eighteen nine. Hopefully, that's great. Hopefully, yeah, man. But uh, come back and talk to us when you're when you're famous and um, you're already famous. But yeah, thanks for hanging out. We'll see you again soon. That's uh, that's it for this episode of the Social Kick Podcast. We'll see you next time. Hey, everybody! Thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it, and make sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment. And make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're also available on YouTube at The Social Kick Podcast, and you can find all of our content on our website, 